Having fought a long and ever-changing pandemic, the world enters the next normal. What megatrends are emerging as a result of the challenges? Join me and an expert panel from across the globe who will examine these key economic trends and the opportunities that come with it. Over the past 36 months, we've seen many changes. But the question is, how are these changes translating into long-term trends? And what would this mean for investors? We begin the discussion with UOB's Head of Wealth Management, Advisory and Strategy, Abel Lim. Last year was an incredible year for investments, particularly in risk assets and in equity prices. You can see the S&P 500 delivered over 28% returns with the broader markets coming at 21.8. And this is the fourth year that US equities had outperformed the broad markets. The world is recovering at quite different pace. The United States and China, through pure political will and through very deep pockets on the monetary and fiscal front, have pretty much brought themselves up to pre-pandemic levels today. However, Europe, including the UK, Japan and Southeast Asia still yet to face the entire recovery or to enjoy the reopening of the world. We think that this represents opportunities for investors throughout the course of this year and maybe next. Equally important, some 50% of the global population has been vaccinated. The number of vaccination around the world allows authorities and regulators to be able to make decisions whether to reopen its borders and global economic activities to restart and to reconnect. And this is important for global recovery, regardless of which part of the recovery cycles that we are in. The Federal Reserve has to balance liquidity to ensure that sufficient stimulus is still in the market and not to store growth. But on the other hand, they are faced with a red-hot economy and heightened inflation. This is something which investors should be paying particular attention to. Clearly, rising rates will prove to be a headwind for fixed income because there's a negative co-relationship between bond yields and also bond prices. As such, we encourage investors to think about shortening the duration of their bond portfolio. And last but not least, portfolios that are heavy on growth assets should consider shifting towards value and cyclical. That is because the growth earnings potential has a longer duration. All right, thanks a lot, Abel, for that. Let's begin the conversation by looking at the global economy. So, Abel, I'm going to start with you. You know, it's a greater sense that we are indeed returning to some sense of normalcy. I mean, 2021 was a bumpy ride. How should we approach 2022? I think it's fair that investors should be concerned given uh, what's happening. I think there are a number of issues that, um, they, that needs to be addressed. Clearly, the first one is COVID-19. Outbreaks around the world is likely to give regulators and authorities concern. Secondly, inflation in the United States is at its 30-year high. The supply shock that decimated the entire global supply chain is now proving to become a supply bottleneck. And that has caused a lot of prices to spike. And at the same time, people will shift from goods demand to a service demand. And service accounts for some two-thirds of the entire GDP population. And that's a big, big number that we should be focusing on. Kunhao, inflation is on the rise and some expect the Fed to also uh, you know, tighten monetary policy, hike interest rates as well, and they may not be alone. What more could be on the cards? You hear the inflation word everywhere. This is a common concern among central banks. The MAS has just tightened the senior policy path because of inflation concerns. And even countries like Germany and Japan are starting to show a little bit of you know, uncomfortable rise in inflation. So this will be the key theme for the year. And you notice for a lot of central banks, they have started in this rate hiking cycle to address this inflation risk. The US Federal Reserve has started pricing hikes this year. Effectively, what this means is that if the Fed does progressively hike across the year, as the futures market has predicted, you will have short-term money market rates coming up to about 1% by the end of the year. Many of us are used to you know, zero rates over the past two years because of COVID-19. Now your LIBOR, CYBOR, your borrowing rates will go up by about 1%. If this cycle continues in the next two or three years, you will find that your interest rates, short-term rates may well rise to about 2% or higher. So investors need to be cognizant of the inflation threat 
Now, I'm not saying that this is a bad investment year. There's always opportunities, but I'm saying that just appreciate that, you know, the period of low to zero interest rates over the past two years is over. Katie, let me pick your brains on this. Are there opportunities and perhaps also risks that investors should be looking at with regards to this? It's one of the reasons that we're having this very violent um, reaction in equity markets is that equity markets um, came into the year at their 90th percentile evaluation. So that meant that they were priced for very, very good news. And of course, the news flow has actually been quite challenging and that set them up for this downdraft. We think you should be in equity markets. We understand that value has outperformed growth. Growth's outperformed value by 200% over the last 10 years, by 2% last year, and value's only advanced by 8% this year. Um, but we do think actually there's an opportunity to run a balanced portfolio, but some of these growth names. Tai Hui, let me pick your brains now. Um, whether it's monetary policy, response to COVID-19, or their steady economic reopening, China always leaves an impact. So what kind of effect will China's comeback have on the markets? I think in 2022, on a net basis, China should be a, a positive for both emerging markets and, uh, and markets as a whole. Uh, last year was really difficult because of the economic slowdown in China, a lot of the tech regulations, uh, controls on property prices, all of which has created a really big downdraft in the Chinese market. And that obviously impacted on the market sentiment across Asia. But this is a very important year politically for China. We do expect uh, more economic stability measures coming through. Fiscal policy, I think, will also play a bigger role in supporting the economy as well. I think on a net basis, from an economic standpoint, I'm expecting China to um, improve in terms of growth, but it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. It's going to be a gradual uh, recovery. I think that should provide something to cheer about for Asian markets, for emerging markets, especially in the context of tight and much policy uh, coming from the U.S. and some of the developed economies. If you look at the chart here, the US and Europe um, in successive waves of COVID in the past you know, 12 to 18 months, uh, governments are taking a more live with COVID approach, contrasting with what's happening in China right now. So in terms of um, the investment, you should be thinking about a more internationally diversified allocation in equities to capture some of the opportunities, especially in Asia, where vaccination rates are going up. And also governments are now starting to become more comfortable uh, with open opening up the economy, such as Singapore. So I think from that perspective, I do think um, a rotation back towards Asia and emerging markets, it does make sense. Coming up on Market Insights, the impact of megatrends in a post-recovery world. I think it's really important to make sure that your capital is on the right side of those disruptions and leaning into those trends. Investors are also often keen to pick up a good bargain. Where should they be looking for some growth potential from these sectors that fly under the radar? We, like many economists around the world, um, are quite optimistic about the growth trajectory in the U.S. Obviously, that's offset by inflationary and rate pressures. And about 80% of the revenues of small cap companies actually tap in to the U.S. domestic market. So it's a great opportunity to get um, you know, d direct exposure to that. What would you say is on the horizon in terms of prices and the overall energy sector at large? Well, if you remember last year when Omicron first hit us, the first thing on everybody's mind is, are you going to have another renewed lockdown in the global economy? Are oil prices going to collapse again? Now, interestingly, crude oil prices are back up above the $80 per barrel handle. And there are some whispers that once you're above here, you know, you're up to 90 and 100. Global demand for energy has slowly crept up to 100 million barrels a day. And if it all goes well, we should see that sometime in the second half of the year. All this supply chain disruption, all this so-called geopolitical risk has started also to push crude oil prices higher. If you look at carbon futures, right, they have all moved up above 80 euros per ton. So all these things may keep energy costs a little bit sustained in the months ahead. For investors who are also business owners, just be a bit mindful that your cost for energy, electricity, will stay high and elevated, and, and you just need to manage your costs a little bit more cautiously. The other big sector is the healthcare industry. The pandemic is going to stay. We're going to live with the virus. Is the healthcare sector something we should be keeping an eye on? The healthcare sector fundamentally is one of the strongest. COVID or not, the world continues to age rapidly. If anything, COVID-19 has actually accelerated research and development. We see advancements and innovation in the treatment 
diagnostics and even service delivery. COVID-19 has also exposed tremendous weaknesses. A lot of countries which we thought were very well prepared, very advanced nations, their medical systems were overwhelmed. And this would definitely cause authorities and governments to rethink their future. Last but not least, I think a lot of medical uh, suppliers and manufacturers suddenly find that they have a global market in their clientele. The healthcare sector as a whole, we like the fundamentals and we think that investors should have that as part of the mega trends in their portfolio. Tai Hui, let me put this to you. What about the other more, perhaps, uh, traditional mainstays like manufacturing? Surely they are also pivoting and are they offering uh, new opportunities for investors? I think so. If you look at, uh, for example, South Korea in 2020 or Taiwan in 2021, uh, the tech manufacturing and exports have done incredibly well and supported their markets uh, to generate really strong return. Um, but in the longer term, I do want to combine innovation and manufacturing. The whole concept of decarbonization means that we have to produce electricity differently. And I think renewable energy and electric vehicles are just two examples of how manufacturing and industry could see some wholesale change in the longer term. When it comes to renewable power, it's going to make up a significant share of uh, global power production, as much as 75% by 2050, as you can see from this chart. So imagine the amount of solar power panels, um, wind turbines, and power generation capability that will need to be manufactured to support uh, this shift. But of course, some of the more traditional manufacturing will also need to evolve. Your iron and steel, your cement making, heavy industries. For those companies who can make these changes, they'll continue to do well. For those who can't, they're going to struggle. But looking at post-recovery world, you know, and, and the way things are changing, Abel, perhaps your take. What's the future going to look like? We have identified mega trends to be strong structural forces that is going to shape or reshape the entire world uh, that we live in. As such, we encourage customers to think through three bigger lenses. The engines of tomorrow, the consumers of tomorrow, and super economies of tomorrow. Technology is going to be one of the biggest industry that is going to reshape everything that we know of today. But at the same time, we also note that technological advances also helps the healthcare sector. So you can see that there's a lot of convergence within all these mega trends. Also on the engines of tomorrow, we think about the millennials and even younger generations and ESG. Consumers of tomorrow is not just about healthcare. We should not forget Asia. Asia's one billion middle-income um, consumers is going to change the landscape in this entire continent. Super economies of tomorrow, if we participate early enough, we will stand to benefit tremendously as the world starts to reshape and reimagine itself a post-recovery world. Katie, I mean, I'm going to get your, your take on this as well. Are these the areas that investors simply cannot afford to ignore? I think it's really important if you can be a long-term oriented investor to make sure that your capital is on the right side of those disruptions and leaning into those trends. But we, we should recognize that the ones that are positioned as disruptors, they are going to have near-term underperformance here because they are the types of companies that will underperform in the face of a rising rate cycle. But if you have a view that that's where the world is shifting, the climate, the, the rise of the millennial consumer, um, the way that healthcare is being completely upended um, by genomics, for example, and the fact that tech winners will be outside of the U.S., around the world, and down the cap, um, then certainly you should you should migrate assets to that part of the world, but be patient. Um, and the market is giving you opportunities to, to step in um, to these types of ideas um, at a discount. Millennials, how do you think they're going to shake things up? Well, there's 2.3 billion millennials globally. 85% um, of them, by the way, live in emerging markets and their earnings power in aggregate has now surpassed Gen X and baby boomers. So we really need to think about how they're going to spend. And so here I would highlight this incredible um, desire for experience over things. And given the COVID backdrop, one will get a lot of opportunity to buy into those experience-related names, whether it's concerts, airlines, hotels, et cetera, um, at actually a discount. So that's an example of that blending value with growth. But there's going to be secular driver of that, um, of that desire for experience over things. And then, of course, this is the first generation of digital natives. They are big believers in tech-enabled consumption. And here I would highlight gaming um, and what will come with the metaverse as, as really interesting parts of the market to pick up. So millennials are very, very important. It's a demographic you want to be invested in and, and know how to navigate. Tai Hui, I mean, the emerging economies and the new middle class, how do you think they're going to set the trend in the months and years ahead? 
I think the importance is not just about the, the, the backdrop of millennials or middle class, but do the companies have the right strategy, the right business model to capture those opportunities? For example, for banks, do they have the right technology to reach out to the unbanked in Indonesia, in India, in South Asia, for example? Do they have the appropriate risk management to make sure that they can, they can grow, but in, in a well-controlled manner? If you look at China, they've experienced a rise of the middle class from consumer goods, they switch to consumer consumer services, do these companies have the right model to capture the appropriate growth at the appropriate juncture? I think that to me is really important in making the most of these trends. Still to come on Market Insights, the role of environmental, social and corporate governance when investing. It's not just about decarbonisation, it's also about investing in well-run companies that have their governance. Okay, we want to shift gears a little bit and talk now about ESG, environmental, social and governance, the ESG sector. As the energy sector continues to rally our ESG-focused investors who refuse to hold stocks that do not match their values, missing out on returns. We are going to go through this huge transition to, to the net zero world and it is going to be a revolution and it is going to be you know, the, the equivalent of, of what we actually went through with the industrial revolution. It's going to be an incredible wealth creating opportunity and I would have capital allocated to alternatives. At the same time, I'm I'm actually not a fan of people divesting from traditional energy stocks in their portfolio because of some of the factor risk that one picks up when you do that around value, for example, but also because there's great alpha opportunities in some of these companies if they can actually reinvent themselves to be on the right side of this transition. Moving traditional companies towards an ESG model can be challenging. Same thing for investors who have been investing traditionally. How do you think they should approach that? Decarbonization is a very rich theme that investors can start with this ESG journey. But it's not just about decarbonization, it's also about investing in well run companies that have their governance, whether their board is well diversified, have the right expertise. All of these are really important when we think about ESG. So it's not just about green and environmentally friendly, but also social and uh, governance issues. But at the same time, we do recognize that. It's actually quite hard for individual investors to understand or assess the quality of companies. So I think it's important to actually reach out to these companies directly, understand their management, their ESG impact, and this does require a lot of resources and expertise. But where are the opportunities now? We've identified three key areas of focus. We like Europe on a valuation standpoint. Um, today, Europe is 16.6 um, times PE, which is a lot lower than the United States. And at the same time, we also think that Europe's um, two trillion euro recovery fund has not run its course. We also like Asia, home to one billion individuals who will move towards the middle income bracket by 2030. I think that's going to create a whole new market, a whole new economy of which global investors cannot afford to, to ignore. As the world continues to reopen and reconnect, I think Asian economies, particularly those who are heavily reliant on exports, will enjoy this tailwind as well. Let me ask Abel, here in Asia, are we primed for a Goldilocks phase for investors? Asia is still pretty much in the early stage of its recovery. We still enjoy relatively low inflationary situation. We still have tremendous monetary support and stimulus in place to help economies recover. And on the demographic front, we continue to see a lot of these younger generations becoming productive assets along the way. So Asia is likely to enjoy a good 10, maybe 15 year tailwind on the back of this very positive uh, pushes. As we begin to wrap up the session, Tai Hui, uh, talk a bit about inflation because uh, COVID uncertainties are still rattling all our nerves. How do you think this is going to affect uh, uh, the way we look at things and how we balance or future-proof our portfolios? You mentioned two very different types of risks, inflation and COVID. And so I think um, to future-proof your portfolio, the starting point is a well-diversified portfolio to be able to handle different types of risks. But at the same time, uh, if you can generate a strong, steady stream of income, over the long term, that is really beneficial uh, to meet different types of challenges. 
Katie, um, perhaps you can uh, share with us, do you think there are other areas that investors are currently underappreciating? There's great opportunities in Europe and Japan in parts of the U.S. equity market to pick up additional yield because you're going to get both growth as well as this yield component, and we think that can perform better than many fixed income assets. I want to emphasize a point around investing in real assets. These assets actually can perform quite well against an inflationary backdrop. And that might be an attractively valued, good yield generating way to get exposure to secular growth. FX rates, commodities, uh, is this a market we should be watching out for? Your global markets, despite correction in the equities and fixed income market, we will all agree that all this correction has been very orderly so far and there's not much elevated volatility yet. If you look at the, the, the volatility indicators, for example, in the FX commodities and fixed income market, they're still very tame compared to previous event risks. In the commodity space, you know, a lot of the inventories are drawn down to record low levels. So commodity prices are very elevated and can be volatile. In the fixed income space, of course, you know, everybody worry about inflation. If it's under control, yield curves will flatten further. If it's not under control, you get back to duration risk again. In the equity space, you have that growth you know, versus value uh, divide all the time. In the FX space, you know, yield curve differentials will always be dynamic. It's not just the Fed that's hiking. Other central banks will try to play catch up. So it's not a clear case of a dollar bull all the time. There will be movements around the FX space. So this will be a year of opportunities if you, know, you have very clear investment ideas uh, and you can spot all these opportunities you know, in FX rates or commodities. Well, Abel, it, it does sound like that we are on the path to recovery, that there are many opportunities out there. What could be a spanner in the works? What could derail us? Rising rates literally sucks up liquidity eh, by drawing down the money supply in the market. But it does not ease up bottlenecks. It does not cause uh, borders to reopen. It, it doesn't um, increase the labour supply. So what happens if rates are high inflation stays equally high and the labour market is incredibly tight. This is a, a cause for concern because if that happens, I think the policies within the Federal Reserve would be very limited. We think that inflation will continue to be a concern for most investors and similarly, the impact on different asset classes, particularly on the fixed income space, will be a challenging headwind. As such, reduce the portfolio duration, focus on Asian and green bonds. On the equity space, some of the key opportunities lies within the European front, the Asian front, the financials, and potentially, in the longer run, the tech space. All right, well, Abel, thank you so much. And thank you to all panellists for giving us so much to think about. Until we meet again, I'm Stephen Chia, and along with the rest of the panel, we wish you good investing and good health. Bye-bye. Brought to you by UOB Privilege Banking.